Salutations. I just like to disclaim this video by saying that I'm going to be approaching this topic of what is happening in the UK a little bit differently. I think a lot of what is going on right now has a lot to do with how particular segments of British society are feeling. And I think that idea of how the segment of society is feeling is an interesting concept and an interesting idea because sometimes how we feel doesn't always match to reality how we feel and the perception that we have of our experiences and of the world around us is really not based in empirical reality, isn't based in statistical analysis and evidence. And in this day and age, I would say regrettably, but also understandably, a lot of how we feel really trumps over what is really going on. And I think that is at the root of a lot of the feeling of anger, of disappointment and of disenchantment that many, not just people on the far right in the UK are feeling at the moment, but also what a lot of specifically white working class British people are feeling. I, as an immigrant who does not have a British passport, I do not exercise or have access to the same rights and privileges as somebody who is British or has a British passport. I have my feelings and I see the world around me from a very different perspective and lens to what I am about to describe here. But nonetheless, I very much want to emphasize how important it is to recognize that even if people are feeling a certain way and are acting in horrible and in some cases in very racist ways, I think that how people are feeling is very important for us to understand in order to get to the root of what is wrong. And I don't think what I've been seeing online at the moment is helping anybody. What I see is more isolation, more detachment from both sides or from either end of the aisle of the or the anti-racist detachment from the white working class and the white more middle to upper classes in the UK, a detachment specifically from, I would say, the government and civil service classes in society and the general population and the institutions that most definitely, in, in a sense, represent the government. And I'd say the most obvious institution in that regard is the UK police. There is a huge detachment and there are huge detachments in British society which are now coming to the foam. And I do also think that one really important detachment that is being exposed here is the detachment between the business of immigration because it is a business above everything else. It is a business that is a for-profit business. Most of the home office's dealings with immigration have been outsourced or contracted to private corporations and they are making a significant profit from exploiting primarily some of the most undereducated and poorest people in the world. It is a very lucrative business, whether it comes to legal or illegal immigration. It is most definitely not something that I think a lot of people are under the impression that immigration is easy, that it isn't costly, that it is just about people coming to this country to enjoy public services, to not contribute in paying taxes, what have you. There's a lot more going on and I think that there's a huge detachment, as I said, between the actual goings on of the business of immigration and what people perceive immigration as. And the only people to blame for this detachment, and I think the people who have always really been to blame for the detachment between what the public thinks and what is really going on, is the government of the day. And this is something which I think the whole of the UK is in agreement on, that is a distrust of government, the institution of government, irrespective of whether whether it is the Conservative or the Labour government, there is a general consensus. And I think that that is something that we need to remember in a lot of this and a lot of what is happening. So my interest in this video is primarily going to be about the white working class in the UK. And I think I do have an interesting insight and perspective into this, not just because I am not a member of the white working class, but specifically because I have lived in both the South and now I live in the North of England. And in the north of England, I live in a village and in a constituency where I am one of two black people registered who lives in my village. Everybody else who lives in my village is white working class. And by white working class, I don't mean just by label. I mean that there is significant pride in being white working class. Nearly every single house, at least when I look out my window, I can see at least 
five English flags uh, flying in the garden or uh, in somebody's window. So this is a very, very English, and I say English uh, as opposed to British community and environment which I live in. And I think I have an interesting perspective into how people are feeling just based on people that I've spoken to, people who I engage with, who I interact with, as well as the surrounding communities that live in my area up north. And so because a lot of the people who are either being vilified or who are involved in what is going on in the UK right now are people who I at least uh, sort of figuratively really do call my neighbours and live around and I hear a lot of their grievances. I would like to just dispel I think a lot of stereotypes that I've seen circulating about the white English working class as well as why people may be feeling the way that they are feeling. From the perspective that isn't going to be something that I have seen quite a bit of people saying that everything is to do with immigrants. Obviously I'm an immigrant myself, I come from that perspective and that is most definitely the perspective which I hold which is one in defending immigrants uh, for I think obvious reasons when you get down to the statistics and the actual empirical reality of immigration. I do want to just disclaim before I start this video with that message. So for anybody who isn't aware, anybody who is international and isn't aware of what I'm exactly talking about here, I do appreciate you being here because I do think this is quite an important topic. But I'd just like to give a very brief rundown of what has transpired to lead up to this point of me talking about what I am talking about. So on July 29th, three little girls, BB King, age six, Elsie Dot Stankum, age seven, and Elise De Silva Agra, age nine, were fatally stabbed at a Taylor Swift themed dance event. Eight other children and two women were also injured, some critically. Now the suspect was later arrested that day and the only information that the police initially gave was that he was 17 years old, he was from a neighbouring village and that he was not affiliated with any organization. Now almost immediately the victims, that is the little girls and the woman, were forgotten and honoring them completely put to the back burner in favor of speculating about the identity of the suspect. Now accusations of the 17 year old suspect being a Muslim immigrant and asylum seeker who had arrived by boat in the UK set off a string of riots across the UK, most importantly and specifically in the north of England and in Northern Ireland's Belfast. We're not in we're not in a Middle Eastern country. We're not in a in a shithole where these things happen on a daily basis. This is England. These are kids. These are little kids. Enough is enough. A soldier. They give us the bullshit with the Manchester stuff to stop us from talking about it. And now look at it. It is enough. As soon as we find out what the situation is, we are hitting the streets. This now deleted article posted on a news website called Channel 3 Now was largely cited as evidence of the attacker's identity. And this story was actually viewed over 2 million times in the first hours that news broke of this attack. The very next day, over a thousand rioters in Southport had violent clashes with police outside a mosque. And there were also clashes in London. However, it was soon confirmed that the 70 year old who was arrested and then charged was Axel Muganwa Radukubana, who is neither Muslim, an asylum seeker, or an immigrant. He is just black. He was born in the Welsh capital of Cardiff to Rwandan parents and has lived in the UK his entire life. A few years ago, he had a role in a West End play and he also landed himself a role in the BBC Children in Needs advertisement in 2018. He was described by neighbours as a quiet choir boy whose parents were very much involved in the local Christian community and church. What was the most notable feature of these widespread riots was their underlying anti-immigration and overtly racist sentiment, which some see as ringing in a new era of British life and culture. Rioters used the former Conservative government's slogan, Stop the Boats, referring to dinghy boats carrying migrants and refugees across the channel. Illegal migration is simply unfair. It's unfair on the British people who have opened their homes to genuine refugees and it's unfair on taxpayers who are having to spend nearly £6 million a day to put up illegal migrants in hotels. That's why one of my top priorities as Prime Minister is to stop the boats 
and I have a clear plan to get it done. And it was only days after the riots in Southport and London that violent far-right riots erupted throughout many major and minor UK towns and cities. And this is violence that hasn't been seen by many since the 1990s in the UK. Protesters, many of whom were not from the local areas, tore down bricks from residential homes to throw at the police and to throw at mosques, and then subsequently left those residential areas in complete devastation and disarray. And what was just as noteworthy was the targeting of of the infamous and so-called asylum hotels. And please don't let the word hotel fool you as it has many a far-right activist and rioter. These are essentially budget hotels that have been given extortionate contracts from the former conservative government to poorly housed refugees and migrants. And these migrants are not allowed to work, contrary to popular belief, and essentially have to spend their days holed up in squalor, sometimes for years with absolutely no rights. And again, contrary to popular belief, no access to benefits or public British services like council housing, education or handouts. The asylum hotel industry is a very lucrative industry and it is no wonder that many of these hotels since the change in government are being closed down for very obvious human rights violations. It is an industry that has made three privately contracted companies supplying these hotels to the British Home Office a record £113 million in profit. And these three companies have been more than doubling their respective profits annually since 2022. And as I said, some of these hotels were targeted violently by rioters whilst children, staff, and I'm sure many a traumatized refugee sat like ducks inside. Now I just give this brief summation of very recent events. There are a few other events that have transpired in the UK and incidents that have transpired, which have, I think, added fuel to the flame and also most definitely contributed to the South port attacks being seen as a final straw for many. But I just give this summation because I think what has transpired and its repercussions has really emboldened a previously very much ignored, pretty inoperative and rather ineffective segment of British society. And I say this for two reasons. Firstly, I say it because Britain is a very, very liberal society that is conservative with a small c. And what I mean by this is that what is quite significant, I think, to Britain relative to the rest of Europe is that even though, like most countries and modern societies, we have a rather significant class divide, and this is very much a society where classism and class politics reign supreme. The working class here, for instance, is notably very pro things like abortion, for instance, very much in line with sort of being conservative with a small c, which essentially means that nobody likes to argue too much and that people tend to believe overwhelmingly that people should be allowed to do what they want with their own bodies, with their own politics, with their own interests, with their own venture in life, essentially. Anything to do with prejudice, bias, racism or bigotry is reserved for either the dinner table or for your private sphere in life or at the most the corner tables in pubs. These sorts of things are not meant to become an overt political issue like what we have seen recently transpiring. And so I think for a lot of people, it isn't so much the the bigotry, the anti-immigration sentiment that is shocking, it's the overtness of it, which is really not the thing to do. And I say that secondly, there is historically and presently a conflicting relationship between Englishness and Britishness. I would say that on the one hand, there's a real lack of a sense of a unifying sense of Britishness. And on the other hand, I'd say that there's also a real lack of any positive identity associated with Englishness. And I'd say that finding a English identity, a positive English identity, and also a homogenous British identity has become even more difficult since from the 1950s to the 1960s, Britain became more multicultural. And I'd say that another factor in this has also been the white British working class losing rather rapidly and traumatically its identity since especially the 1970s and 1980s in the north of England. There have been, I would say, rather vain attempts 
at trying to find or trying to kindle this sense of Englishness as well as the sense of a British identity. The latest example being the UK referendum to leave the European Union or probably more accurately baby boomers now very much regretted decision to leave the European Union which has not in fact stalled immigration but has in fact led to higher immigration but that's a video for another day. But I do think that these two points are key to trying to understand what is happening in the UK right now and that's why I would really like to start with this point about especially white Britishness and Englishness. And again I just like to add a disclaimer that this is purely me analyzing just what I see around me, what I read, the current zeitgeist as it were. This isn't neither a suggestion of my beliefs or my politics. I'm neither on the left nor on the right. I really do not care for politics beyond analyzing it. So please do keep that in mind. British national identity and Britishness is a very controversial and contested concept, especially since the 20th century and especially for the English. Whereas most modern nations have found and defined their sense of national identity from within, a resistance to outsiders, a shared sense of homogenous identity and experiences, the British and specifically the English have uniquely derived a sense of historical identity and narrative from from things outside of themselves and the nation. That is, most notably, via empire and via colonialism. From the 18th to the 20th centuries, Britain was described as the empire on which the sun never sets because of how much of the globe made up the British Empire. And I'd just also like to note in this that unlike most prominent European nations, the British, specifically the English, never had a fully fledged revolution which completely transformed the very foundations of the nation and society and importantly never gave the English the sense of identity and historical storytelling that revolutions typically give a nation. And I would say that because of this many historical institutional realities like the very rigid class division in British society historically have remained presently even whilst Britain has throughout history become increasingly democratic. Now since the fall of empire in the 20th century defining Britishness has been in limbo because of, I would say, three reasons. Firstly, Britain's imperial history is very much debated over whether it is something to be proud of or to be ashamed of, and nobody is really in agreement on this. Secondly, immigration from the former British Empire, that is from Commonwealth countries since the 1950s and 60s, has made mainland Britain very multicultural very quickly. And thirdly, as I said before, Englishness is very different to Britishness. Whilst the Welsh and the Scottish have a very clear sense of homogenous identity and shared history, a lot of which has to do with not being English, the English, and I would include the Northern Irish in this, do not have a clear sense of homogenous identity that can go and that does go beyond empire, beyond colonialism, and beyond Protestantism and the history of Protestantism as a rather oppressive force. At least how Protestant Protestantism is perceived by outsiders. Basically, many on the right either believe that Britishness has never historically existed, or they believe that contemporarily at least, Britishness does not exist due primarily to immigration. And they most definitely believe that Britishness, like Englishness, cannot exist beyond white Britons. In contrast, many on the left see Englishness as almost synonymous to Britishness, seeing it through the lens of immigration, multiculturalism, and political pluralism. According to the left, your skin tone and Anglo ancestry doesn't determine whether or not you are British. Your contribution to Britain determines that. I think it's important to acknowledge that there does tend to be a bit of a generational divide in concerns about Britishness and Englishness. I do find that younger Britons don't tend to care too much about this as a marker of identity in as much as other more modern and popular forms of identifying. The only young people who I do tend to see concerned with Englishness and Britishness are white working class younger males. And that is why I think over the past few days there have noticeably been quite young, very young in some cases, white people who have been prosecuted because of these riots and their participation in these riots. And I do in this vein find white British identity very interesting because I think that contemporarily there are only really two things that I can really identify 
identify as really ticking all the boxes of defining a sense of Britishness for white Britons. Firstly, the monarchy, that is the royal family, and especially its ties to empire and greatness. And secondly, the Church of England and therefore Protestantism. And I think what is noticeable about both of these institutions is that they are in decline insofar as their influence over the general, specifically white population. Their relevancy beyond tourism is going to be very interesting to see in the future. I think what was very significant about these riots is that the vast, vast majority of them happened in the north of England where I currently live. And as I said at the beginning of this video, I live in a very white working class area of the UK. And what I've noticed is that white working class people have a very, very strong sense of Englishness, but not of Britishness. When I've asked people, specifically men, whether they would fight for this country Across the board, they say no, they have absolutely no interest in Britain. They do not associate or feel British because they don't believe in Britain, especially and most importantly, not in the government. There is great distrust of government for understandable reasons, but they most definitely do feel English. What I've noticed, for instance, is that where I live, there are three groups of people who are disliked far more than me. Uh, me, I don't mean me specifically and individually, but me as in what I represent based on how I look. Firstly, Pakistani Muslims, I would say, are the most distrusted and most disliked group in the whole of the north of England among the white British population. And of course, just a disclaimer, I'm talking in generalizations here. I'm sure that there's going to be lots of people in my comments who are from the north of England who are very liberal, who have very different views. So please don't see this as an affront to you or anything. This is purely an analysis. I'm just interested in this stuff. I get on very well with everybody in whatever community I am in. So this is not saying that people are wrong in how they feel about things, as I said at the beginning of this video. The very strong sense of community and homogeneity of the Pakistani Muslim community in the north of England, I think is very much perceived as an affront to white British people, specifically to white northern based and working class British people who don't have the same sense of a very strong sense of group and identity allegiance and most definitely relative to the influence of the Church of England on the white working class population, do not have the same kind of allegiance to a religion and religious identity. And I think being faced with that and also faced with just demographic realities that there is most definitely in the north of England, areas and communities and cities that are very Muslim dominated. People feel scared, they feel anxious because of something that is perceived as alien, that is perceived as outside of them, that is perceived as taking over in a country where I must most definitely admit a lot of the concerns and a lot of the issues and the very real qualms of white working class people are either ignored or are just not significant in the rhetoric and zeitgeist of the day that is very, I would say, white, liberal, middle to upper class oriented. The second group of people who are disliked more than me, I would say, in the north of England are the Irish, at least in the part of the north where I live. And the third group of people who I would say are disliked more than me are Poles, uh, that is Polish immigrants to the UK. And I'd say that this very much stems from specifically Brexit, but even before Brexit, I think Brexit just gave more overt voice to this and made people a lot more confident in expressing their anti-Polish sentiment and more generally their anti-Eastern European sentiment. Similarly to how I think these riots have now given rise to people being far more open and overt about their anti-immigration and I would say even more significantly just their anti-Pakistani Muslim sentiment. And I say Pakistani Muslim sentiment specifically because of the various slurs that I openly hear toward Pakistani Muslims. This is something that has, I have very much noticed in the past few weeks has become far more overt. And this is very telling of how things, I think for many people have allegedly changed, how there has been a cultural shift in the UK and in people being far more open and overt and confident in their opinions. And I think that there are very important and interesting reasons as to why suddenly 
and very contrary to everything that is liberal about Britain, everything that I think a lot of especially young people believe about the world and about how you treat your fellow human beings. Why this overt and overt xenophobia is now suddenly being seen as okay and more than that as important and integral to the very future of the United Kingdom and of specifically for a lot of people to the very survival of Englishness. So in the rest of this video, I'm going to be trying to analyze why that is. Firstly, I think it has a lot to do with a lot of thought leaders and far-right political figures and commentators spreading the particular message that firstly, free speech is under dire threat in the UK. Secondly, that misinformation in fact is not misinformation. It is merely the powers that be trying to hide the real truth from you. And I'd say thirdly, it has a a lot to do with this perception of two-tier policing. A perception that I'm going to argue is very real, but is very real in a way that I think is very antithetical to what many on the far right are trying to claim. And can I just add, worse still, yes. there is a proposal, a proposal today that from the age of five years old, our kids in schools should be taught to spot extremism, to spot fake news and misinformation, and to use their powers of critical thinking to work out what's true and what's not. Now, by the way, I believe in critical thinking. However, if the parameters that are set are to say to every kid, if you read a post that questions net zero and global warming, it will be extreme content and a lie. If you read a post that even dares to question levels of immigration, legal or illegal, into Britain, that that's extremist, then you start to set a narrative for a future generation that is fundamentally undemocratic. So I am very worried that the instincts of a left-wing Labour Party are to use this crisis to take away our liberties and our free speech. And this is going to have to be fought. I don't think many people in the world thought that free speech would be something that would be so pertinent to what is currently happening in the UK and to the perceived future of the UK. But here we are. Now, when it comes to everything about what is happening in the UK, what is happening not just in the UK, but I think what is happening in a lot of the modern world is that a lot of this is happening online. A lot of this has been driven by individuals with very vested interests online and with regards to their online careers and their online ventures. In the real world, Elon Musk has no vested interest nor any real interest in the UK. But online, it seems to have really become a great part of his persona in recent weeks. According to him, civil war is inevitable in the UK. I mean, personally, it doesn't surprise me that the owner of a rapidly declining social media platform riddled in anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, general racism and uncensored is resorting to his typical rage-baiting antics to keep users on Twitter, no matter the real world or societal consequences. But I do believe that Elon Musk, like many on the online, emphasis on the online far right, believes in what he is shamelessly and also provocatively spewing. His history of spreading misinformation is disgraceful and is why engaging with the news critically and with as much information as possible is more important than ever. This is why I religiously use Ground News, an app and website that lets you compare news stories and media coverage from across the political spectrum. And by compare, I mean far more than just having access to articles gathered in one place. I mean that Ground News gives you further information and context about said articles, as well as information into the political leanings, the reliability and ownership of publications. I've been using Ground News to get to grips with the current UK riots and their aftermath, especially because there's just so much misinformation and biased reporting out there. This article on British Prime Minister Keir Starmer calling out Elon's claims of inevitable civil war breaking out in the UK shows an incredible breakdown of information. I can see that the story's been covered by 80 sources to date and the percentage of a left to right leaning coverage. And this gives me a very good indication into the bias underpinning each story, which Ground News also breaks down for you with its bias distribution. And if you scroll down, you can actually see every single article about this topic and you can also compare their headlines. Seeing how a right leaning conglomerate like Fox describes 
describes Elon's tweets as a war on words, referencing the Soviet Union, whilst left-leaning conglomerates focus on the irresponsibility of Elon himself, centering on how he was scolded by the British government, has been very insightful into the forces at play behind a story and why it is being covered the way it is being covered. Right now, sensational headlines and language, not critical thinking, are what sell a story. And being able to see who owns a publication, the assessed factuality behind a story, as well as why particular headlines are used, has really piqued my critical faculties when presented with a story that I would have otherwise just taken as credible and reliable. Things have really changed in our digital landscape and Ground News is helping me navigate this. One of my favorite Ground News features is the My News Bias feature. And this shows me an in-depth report on the news that I'm reading as well as the sources that I read from. I like how this feature visually exposes my own bias to me and can potentially get me out of my media bubble. And just looking here, most of my news is center and I'm pretty relieved to see that my factuality rating is pretty high, even though there is of course room for improvement. There always is. And this feature is fully accessible through the Vantage subscription and is, in my opinion, invaluable to you being a critical media consumer these days. I've also found it very difficult to know where to start when news breaks and Ground News' ability to give me access to a diverse range of articles from across the globe without being inundated or misled by what I'm reading is crucial. So go to ground.news forward slash Kidology to try out Ground News for yourself. And if you sign up using my link, you will get an incredible 40% off the Vantage plan, which is what I use to get unlimited access to all of Ground News' features. I really do think that Ground News is doing vital and crucial work, and I really do hope you enjoy them as much as I do. So please do check them out for yourself. Something that is noticeable about the far right's evolution into modern day social media stardom is their conflation of free speech with doing and saying whatever we want in the name of true democracy. And nobody exemplifies this better than Elon Musk and his use of Twitter as a personal vessel for his political views and provocative god play. And looking at Elon's tweets, he is very far right coded in his aesthetic. And I say aesthetic because I don't believe he, like many far right figures, figures and leaders online would actually leave their ivory towers of wealth and, I don't know, making £100,000 for 32 hours of work a month. Yes, Nigel Farage makes £100,000 for 32 hours of work a month, which I think is just interesting considering he brands himself and presents himself as some leader of the working man, the hard working man in Britain, to do anything really meaningful or transformative offline. This is very much an aesthetic whose real world consequences they are exempt from because they spend most of their time online and are just, well, rich. It was very noteworthy that after the nation attempt on Donald Trump, his usual violent rhetoric and willingness to tolerate political violence suddenly became a call to unity. Similarly, many far-right figures like Nigel Farage are now condemning the violence that they put the wind in the sails of. The riots have stopped for the short term because the population has been gaslit. So the government kept trying to look for an enemy, try to look for a boogeyman, and they blamed the far right. I mean, there is no far right in Britain. So what was happening was that ordinary British folk were getting upset, getting angry, getting frustrated, and, and protesting. And some of the protests turned into riots. And so the government tried to blame it on the far right, which does not exist. This is a very recognisable far right and far left cycle in which very wealthy ideologues and thought leaders who predominantly sit online will never get their hands dirty while simultaneously provoking others, namely and specifically poorer others, to do their dirty work for them. And then inevitably, when the provoking gets out of hand, when the real world consequences get out of hand, they will temporarily wash their hands of all wrongdoing, of all the wrongdoing which their rhetoric provoked and started in the first place. And this is because wealthy provocateurs posing as being for the true people, the true nation, or the true working people like Donald Trump, like Elon Musk, Nigel Farage, and Lawrence Fox, embody the far right aesthetic that is very typical of the online far right. You can always identify them by their constant nostalgic lamentations on a past that never was. Their rumination 
implications on the future of civilization, and especially their apocalyptic thinking, which will either reduce immigrants to being the source of all evil and all issues, or will typically reduce modern women to nothing more than baby-making machines who are responsible for the inevitable collapse of humankind. Life, according to these ideologues and according to these figures who primarily congregate on X, is always riddled in conflict, in warfare and strife. And what I've noticed is that in the mix is this idea that the censoring of free speech by especially modern feminists, by progressives and democrats, is at the root of what will inevitably be civilizations that is modern, particularly white civilizations, collapse. And importantly, something that these far-right aestheticians most definitely believe of themselves is that they are the real champions of true democracy. A democracy that has been tainted and distorted by the likes of progressives, by the likes of feminists, by the likes of people who are, for instance, pro-immigration. Free speech is the bedrock of a functioning democracy, and Twitter is the digital town square where matters vital to the future of humanity are debated. The far right online and Elon Musk have a very particular understanding of free speech, which goes back to the ancient Greeks and a controversy around the meaning of free speech. Now, in advance, I do apologize, but I don't speak Homeric, nor biblical, nor modern Greek, so my pronunciation is obviously going to not be it. But the Greek for Asgoria and Parhysia roughly translate into our modern meaning of freedom of speech, yet they both mean different and oftentimes conflicting things. In ancient Athens, Asgoria describes the equal right of citizens to participate in public debate in the democratic assembly. For instance, when Elon idealizes Twitter as being some kind of digital town square where vital matters are debated, he inadvertently is referring to the ideal of Isgoria, where free speech is conceived as a kind of marketplace of ideas. Parhesia, the license to say what one pleased, how and when one pleased and to whom, describes the alternate and oftentimes conflicting meaning of freedom of speech. And this latter meaning of freedom of speech is really what most on the online far right or those who are very much far right coded subscribe to, whilst professing to be upholding the equal right of citizens to participate in public debate in the democratic assembly. And I think this is very important to note because there is nothing more intriguing than a contradiction. There's nothing more intriguing than the real complexities and intricacies of something that seems as simple and banal as freedom of speech. And it is very clear to me that like everybody else, the far right is just as ready to censor and to ignore those who practice and exercise their freedom of speech contrary to them. Freedom of speech for my friends and for me, but most definitely not for my enemies and thee. And I'd also just like to take us back to my point about what one feels relative to what is really going on. That is relative to the reality of the situation. A lot of people who are very far right coded at the moment feel that they do not have access to freedom of speech like other groups of people do. But just a quick browse on just a video about Muslims in the UK will lead you into a plethora of comments saying the most hateful, most horrendous things, most racist things that I've probably ever seen in my life about British Muslims. And whilst these people are saying these sorts of things, they are simultaneously saying that their right to say such things is being censored, when clearly that is really not the case for the vast majority of people who have a lot of very fruitful things, to just put it liberally, to say on the internet. Some of these comments, and most definitely not all of them, are hateful. A lot of these are just examples of people exercising exercising their so-called freedom of speech. But these comments go back nearly 10 years ago. And as far as I know, not one of these people has been arrested. Uh, not one of these people has had their accounts shut down on YouTube. I think that a lot of this is very much about how one feels as opposed to, as I said, about what may actually be going on. Is anyone else ready? Ready? Because I'm ready. I'm literally ready. Like, this is, this is it. Like, honestly, if we find out this fella's come out over on a boat, yeah, how much more, yeah, how much more until we say that actually going down somewhere and just walking the streets is not going to change anything? Like, we need to be going to the home office and we need to be making sure none of them can leave that building. Like, we're... Uh, 
Totally. We need to do something very extreme. I'd say that another thing that really ties into what I said about freedom of speech currently as it is being utilized on the internet is the power or the modern power of misinformation. And I don't necessarily blame the spread of misinformation entirely on those spreading misinformation. Misinformation spreads when the information being given isn't good enough. And this is mainly because the information being conveyed either isn't clear enough or isn't being conveyed fast enough. And in the world of social media, conspiracy theorists and online commentators don't have to go through the same checks and balances, the same bureaucratic processes, nor the expected time of research into something, which conventional media and conventional sources necessarily have to. Getting, for instance, newspaper articles written, then edited, and then approved takes a lot of time. And regrettably, traditional media has a known and true case of social media illiteracy. And this is something that the far right online has exposed and capitalized on magnificently. When conventional media is widely deemed to be uncredible, to be biased, and to be untrustworthy, it is absolutely no wonder why misinformation and disinformation can be presented as credible by mere dint of not being traditional. And it doesn't even seem to matter anymore if the information being spewed is completely false. Significantly, a Reuters Institute global survey found that people today slightly prefer to have their news chosen by algorithms than by editors or journalists. And this is worrying especially because well over half of those surveyed acknowledged and worried that they were unable to identify and to distinguish between real news and fake news online. And again, the far right online, and specifically with regards to what has transpired in the UK as of late, the UK far right online is a class act on capitalizing on this predicament. In response to Twitter journalists, and I do have to put parentheses around journalist David Atherton's breaking news that the Southport perpetrator was a Jordanian Palestinian channel migrant, his followers were quick to note that the fact that this blatant and obvious spread of misinformation actually didn't matter. Both Muslims and Rwandans come from alien cultures. i just like to note that over 90% of Rwanda's population are Christian, the majority of them Protestants, just like in the UK, so not such an alien culture after all. Foreigners are most of the problem with violent crime. Now this is a very good example of why misinformation and disinformation are so readily able to spread these days. And this perception is allowed to spread because, as I said, the information that is being given to us is not good enough or isn't being conveyed fast enough. And the reason is because the British Home Office does not keep and has never released data on the types of crime or the number of crimes committed by migrants. So it is no wonder to me why misinformation and disinformation are able to spread. And at the same time, why one can't just claim without any empirical evidence that migrants commit more violent crime. Both points can be true at the same time and I think it is very indicative of why conspiracy theories, of why misinformation and disinformation are spreading so readily and so easily. It feels like something is being hidden, it feels like the home office has something to hide and people are regrettably going to fill in the blanks. But what I've noticed that the far right online mostly thrives on is not facts but perception. And perception has everything to do with how one feels, with fear-mongering. I feel like like my country is being overrun by migrants because, for instance, I live in Bradford. Illegal migrants are coming into this country and taking all of our jobs. Groom gangs are roaming the streets of West Yorkshire completely unchallenged. I am in no way condoning the police handling of grooming in the UK. But on the other hand, I'm not going to fall into the trap of perceiving it as a mere example of allegedly hundreds of thousands of especially alleged Muslim men grooming young white British girls. This is a perfect example yet again of how perception is allowed to reign supreme over reality and the facts of the matter. Many on the far right like to cite how gangs of Muslim men in the north of England, specifically in Yorkshire, are not just abusing children but are being handled more leniently by the police. Now these are the faces of all the individuals in the whole of Yorkshire who have been convicted of crimes against children, the most horrendous crimes against children imaginable. Now I can only go off really the names and the faces of these individuals, but overwhelmingly the vast majority of these criminals are white British individuals. The very understandable anger and distrust around what has happened in Yorkshire in the past years has I think really taken 
taken away from the reality. A reality that it isn't just migrants who commit violent crimes, who harm children. It is regrettably a human thing that no society is exempt from. Britain is not exempt from it, as these pictures clearly display. It is a hard thing to stomach, but I also do think that the perception has really changed, in which, at least where I live, there is a very widespread perception that crimes against children are simply committed by migrants, are simply committed by brown men, are simply committed by Muslims, when that clearly is not at all the case. I always hear about how especially migrant men are bringing their backward culture, their backward traditions, their backward view of women and children into modern progressive western societies. I never hear about how maybe a widespread culture of abuse of children in say Britain, which is indeed very widespread, is maybe perceived as normal in the multicultural fabric that is Britain. If something can allegedly be true going one way, why can it not be allegedly true going the other way? Of course, I most definitely do not believe either. I do not think that any society is superior to another when it comes to such crimes. As history shows, violence is a human thing. It is not a cultural thing. Online, perception is far more powerful nowadays than relaying facts, than relaying statistics and studies. And the current crown kings of misinformation online know this all too well. And I talk about misinformation and the growing modern power of misinformation, especially as I see it online with the far right, because I think it has interesting ties to things such as this new phenomena that seems to be everywhere on the internet, at least, called two-tier policing. The left don't like prison unless they don't like the people they're putting in there. So everybody's a victim, according to the left, apart from, say, the white working class who you could stereotype as right-wing Why? Again, Elon Musk is one of the main online voices perpetuating this claim of two-tier policing in the United Kingdom. For Elon, as well as for many other far-right thought leaders and individuals online, two-tier policing is really at the root of what will, according to them, eventually spiral into civil war breaking out in the UK. Now, as it pertains to policing in the UK, TTP refers to the belief that ethnic minorities are policed softly or more leniently than white British people, specifically white British males. In recent weeks, the idea has been reiterated by the infamous anti-Islam campaigner and far-right activist Tommy Robinson, by Lawrence Fox, by Nigel Farage and others, with the example of how Metropolitan Police officers dealt with Black Lives Matter protesters back in 2020, describing it as soft policing. And I think this is yet another example of how the far right online is capitalizing on a greater social issue and a greater social feeling. In the UK, public trust in the British criminal justice system is at an all time low. And I would say for very good reason. If I was to be lenient in my analysis of two-tier policing, I would argue that Britain doesn't have a two-tier policing system based simply on racial groups, but a two-tier police system also based on social class groups, which historically are endemically British in nature. I'll give an example from my own life. When I lived in the south of England, I lived in Cambridgeshire and was therefore under the jurisdiction of the Cambridgeshire Police Force. You won't find many people in specifically Cambridge who have an issue with the Cambridgeshire Police Force because notably the number one crime that they have to deal with is bicycle theft. Now where I live in the north of England the situation is very very different. I really noticed moving up here how present the police are in people's lives in a very different way. They are very much there as a deterrent, very much there to keep law and order. Cambridge just as a university city was also very multicultural. That is people from different cultures, backgrounds and racial groups mixed very well and effectively together. What is noticeable living in the north of England is that multiculturalism manifests very differently to how it does in Cambridge. And I would say just generally in the south, specifically in London and the closer you get to the bubble of London. Here, communities do not mix. I live in a very white working class area and village. And beyond my village, there is a very homogenous Muslim community, city and town. These communities do not mix and 
there is clear animosity between them. It was quite a culture shock coming here to see how distinct these two communities are from each other. And just trying to be analytical about this, I would say that there most definitely where I live is a perception of two-tier policing. And I think it primarily comes down to the fact that there is a culture of drinking where I live and I think in particular parts of the north of England in which police are very much present in regulating and trying to control drunk and disorderly activities and things that happen. If I go out on a Friday or a Saturday evening, I will see a lot of already drunk young men out and about and the police steadily in tow. So when it comes to where I live, there most definitely is a perception and I can understand there being a perception for a lot of people who just see what they see in their community and in their bubble, that white males, specifically young white males, are more readily arrested and are more readily in direct confrontation with the police than are ethnic minorities. And I think this perception is really something that in recent weeks the far right in the UK has capitalised greatly on. I think in the north of England there is, depending on where you live, a very high perception that two-tier policing does exist in the UK. However, the reality of policing as a whole in the UK and statistically does not readily support the perception. But as I said, right now, perception is really trumping over facts, statistics and the truth, especially because those who really depend on and produce that information are institutions and individuals who are not trusted. The far right and many right-leaning publications in the UK like to lament on a non-existent time in which, at least according to one journalist, British policing has traditionally been rooted in egalitarian democratic values. Now, as a foreigner with a very keen interest in British history, I must profoundly and dogmatically protest this claim that the British police have ever been democratic or egalitarian. Just open any basic GCSE history book and uh, believe you me, this, this can be dispelled in about like two minutes. <laughs> perception really is everything. My personal perspective and perception of the police is very positive. I've never had any run-ins with the police and all of my encounters with the police have been very positive. But the overall picture is very different for people who look like me. My perception is just that, a perception. It isn't factual and it most definitely isn't representative of everybody and what is really going on. But right now, this clearly doesn't matter. Right now, perception is king. Throughout English history, there is evidence of police violently suppressing not just riots, but protests, especially non-violent protests and attempted uprisings in noticeably industrial areas and working class communities. The targets of this police brutality, both historically and presently are overwhelmingly Britain's most disenfranchised. However, the face of working class, poorer and disenfranchised Britons has changed dramatically from the industrial era. This face is far more multicultural, it's far more ethnic, it's far more educated and it is far more online. Another claim of TTP is that it permits freedom of expression for particular individuals and not to others. Namely, freedom of expression is allowed for the likes of activists climate activists, trendy activists, as they are sometimes called online, relative to most notably white working class activists and white working class individuals protesting their grievances. Now, protest is perfectly legal in the UK, as is freedom of expression protected under the European Convention of Human Rights. That is peaceful and non-violent protests like what Just Stop Oil protesters or pro-Palestinian protesters and climate activists are doing, is markedly different to any damage or violence caused or inflicted during a protest. And believe you me, I find them just as disruptive, annoying and virtue signaling as most people do. And legally, this is where the line between protesting and protesting is crossed. And when soft policing very rapidly evolves into hard policing. This is why the rioting protesters who were charged with violent disorder, harassment, alarm or distress assaulting an emergency worker, possession of a weapon, burglary or online offences are rioters and not protesters. And I think this shows how crucial context is. There are important distinctions between, if we're going to be specific, 40-year-old white males setting fire to hotels full of asylum seekers, hotel staff and children, as well as those online inciting that violence and organising that violence, and pro-Palestinian activists and students virtue signalling on their 
college campuses and courtyards peacefully and for the most part non-violently. I've also seen some on the right signaling to how climate activists are treated more leniently relative to specifically white British males protesting their grievances. And again, I really think a lot of this has to really do with perception. Everybody really thinks that their reality, that is their perception, is far more difficult than everybody else's. This really is not the reality. Whilst far-right rioters were given roughly two to three year sentences, roughly at the same time, Just Stop Oil protesters are actually facing record-breaking sentences over a sophisticated and costly plot to block the M25. And these are the longest sentences ever given in the UK for non-violent protests. Now this hardly sounds like two-tier policing treating minorities and trendy activists more leniently than white British males. Because according to many a trendy activist in the UK, they are actually the ones who are being treated more harshly by the criminal justice system, more harshly than rioters. They are the ones who are in fact the true victims of two-tier policing. Perception is a beautiful thing and at the moment reality is really on the side of the perception of climate activists. I recently read an article written by a journalist in a conservative paper who describes herself as a connoisseur of protests. Her main argument was that BLM protesters in Trafalgar Square were treated more leniently than anti-lockdown protesters who were mainly composed of working class folk. And I kid you not, she describes the BLM protests, which she went to for research purposes, as festive. The atmosphere was festive, some sat drinking cans and the air was laced with cannabis. It was basically a street party with the police looking placidly on. She then describes the atmosphere of the mainly working class anti-lockdown protests as tense and the police as responding and acting antagonistically. I think once again this is a perfect example of how vital and crucial context is. Cannabis induced protesters enjoying a street party allegedly in support of black lives are very different to people tense protesting lockdown legislation during a state of emergency when emotions, tensions and nationwide fear are incredibly high. And in fact, crime statistics show that far more total arrests were made of BLM protesters and climate protesters than were of anti-lockdown and anti-vax protesters. Again, perception is starting to very worryingly rule over reality. And this is in no way to justify the police trying to disperse crowds antagonistically. Believe you me, the institution of policing in the UK has most definitely never had any regard for the British working classes, either now or historically. But it nonetheless baffles me how a journalist can't see how blatantly different the contexts are which she is willingly describing to her readers. This article really doesn't prove two-tier policing in the way that the journalist thinks. In fact, I think it shows something far more important and genuine about the general state of policing in the UK. It shows why trust in the police throughout the UK is dismally low. The police really aren't on anybody's side except depending on the division and who is in charge, their own most of the time. I also think another important thing to do with trust in the UK police, especially in its very low levels of trust throughout the UK, is the fact that the UK police force is really not reflective of the wider British population. That is, it really isn't reflective of the diversity of the British population. And I don't just mean ethnic diversity, I mean gender diversity, I mean class interest diversity, I mean the diversity and the distinction very clear distinctions between the north of England and the south of England. And this is something which no doubt makes trust in the police force that looks nothing like nor represents the interests of the general population impossible, as many recent scandals have shown. And therefore it is no wonder to me why so many Britons feel like they are not treated fairly nor leniently by the police. And although I really do sympathise with this perception that many individuals and groups have, the reality is really not so straightforward nor so simple. There is far greater long-term evidence to show that white Britons are not treated less leniently by the criminal justice system than ethnic minorities, specifically ethnic minority males. And the problem, yet again, really has nothing to do with the reality. Most of this really does have to do with perception. The problem is that the perception of two-tier policing flourishes and is continuing to flourish in the UK. Nobody, especially up in the north of England and in major cities, 
cities like London and Birmingham trust the police. And at the same time, nobody, especially up north in their divided communities, trusts the other who is foreign, who is allegedly not assimilated enough, who isn't integrated enough, who is bringing a foreign culture and most importantly, a foreign religion, which hardly anybody knows anything about, into our Christian country. And this problem of perceptions flourishing in the UK is really something that especially the UK police are culpable in allowing to flourish. And this is really something that the UK police force and criminal justice system have to deal with as the monolithic institutions that they are from within. And more importantly, I would say something that most groups in the UK are in unanimous agreement about is that the UK political class is really the most culpable for all of this. I would strongly argue that the UK political classes have allowed perception to flourish unchallenged and unfettered for decades. And this is of course in the interest of power and just regrettably the way that democracy works. Scapegoats are very convenient for winning elections and making false promises to the most aggrieved and ignored in society is the name of the game in UK politics. It isn't a stretch to say that there is a huge disconnect between what is happening online and what that results in in the real world and the UK political class and criminal justice system. And I think the grievances and perceptions, real or not, that have filled this gap have been there for decades and are only going to continue to flourish. So, with all that being said, what now? And I can honestly say I really do not know. I really do not know what is happening in Britain right now. I don't necessarily know if this is reigning in a new era. It really does feel like a repeat of a lot of what happened in especially 2020. But I would like to conclude my thoughts by comparing these two pictures. This picture is of residents of Southport paying tribute to the victims of the Southport attack. The residents had a beautiful vigil where children blue bubbles and lay flowers, coming together as a community to remember the victims, the injured and their families. Now contrast that to this image, or to this image, and the many images and videos circulating right now of rage, of looting, of a lot of anger, and there is something glaringly obvious. Whenever a disgruntled man attacks women and girls, whether it be at a Taylor Swift themed dance class or an Ariana Grande concert, it seems like way too many people, and especially the media, forget about the predominantly woman and girl victims and fixate almost exclusively on the male perpetrator. And they don't fixate on his motives, but more so on his identity. And it oftentimes justifies other angry, predominantly men, finding a convenient excuse to express their rage, to express their disenchantment and anger at the world, or more specifically, their anger at their country, at an entire complex community, at a convenient scapegoat. And you know, a lot of this has to do with a modern identity crisis inflicting many a different community in different ways. But it doesn't have nearly enough to do with the victims of the violence being perpetrated as a consequence, which is overwhelmingly perpetrated against women and children. Instead of trying to get to the root of why so many vigilante males are targeting women and girls, I think a great deal of our attention and our resources are being misplaced. Too much of the interest in dealing with and understanding identity and identity politics is profit-driven, is eager driven, is self-interestedly driven. And sadly, it feels that, especially online, there is way too much interest in an identity crisis that is never going to be solved in the easy, quick-fix ways that people claim. These riots and a lot of the sentiment behind them has really shown how simplistic explanations conveniently mean that we don't have to take a good look at ourselves. We don't have to take a complex and nuanced look at our communities, at our values, at the reality of the world around us that we are a part of. Because contrary to many a rioter and provocateur's beliefs, violence against women, against men, against children, isn't something that just happens over there in Islamic countries. It is something that happens right here, in our homes, in our Western countries, which, whether we like it or not, includes and probably will always include migration and immigration. And this isn't to say that the surge in mass migration to especially Western Europe isn't a problem. 
them. But it is very telling that now and in the history of Europe, mass migration has only ever become a problem when the level of low-skilled migrants has surged and when GDP per person either stays the same or falls. This is the case in England right now. Public services are in a dismal state and as I said, the political and civil classes are very disconnected from the genuine grievances that many in the population have. Trust is at an all-time low and I think our values really do not align in an age where divisive, digitalized identity politics reign supreme. The far right is going to keep co-opting grievances. They did this in 2020 and will no doubt continue to do this in the very near future. And what is undeniable is that they are increasingly doing this with greater levels of success. And I'm not going to say much more than that because I'd like to hear from you and I have also just had a procedure and I am not doing very well. <laughs> what do you think about what has happened? What do you think about what is allegedly and seemingly going on? Do you think that things are changing in Great Britain? And do you like or are you supportive of the changes that you perceive as being the case? Or just what is your perspective in general? I'd be fascinated to know. Please do be respectful in the comments and please do be understanding of everybody's different perspectives and views. Treat others the way that you would like to be treated. And I'll see all of you very, very soon in the next one.